We can see in Jeremiah had every excuse ready when God called him to be a prophet. His excuses are often our excuses for not heeding the call of God in our lives. But you see, no matter what kind of excuse we do, like what we've studied last week, there God has always an answer and God has always a promise that will negate every excuse that we may try to uh, invent in not obeying the voice of God. When I was in a Bible school, there is this uh, song that they always sing. You know that song, Excuses? I, I, I do not know that, but the, li the, uh, the lyrics, but it goes like this. Excuses, excuses, we give them every day. So the devil, he'll supply them just to keep them folks away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always uses. So to keep those folks away from church, he offers them excuses. And then the verses of the song offers ex excuse after excuse for not attending church. That uh, one has a cold and uh, relatives have visited them. And all of these excuses so that they will not go into the house of the Lord. So that is what is happening even in the Christian world. But let us look at what excuses Jeremiah gave and what promise God gave him so that his excuse will be negated and he will be encouraged to serve the Lord. So in verse number 5, we can see that a God called Jeremiah. And it says this, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of thy womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nations. So Jeremiah was called to be a prophet to the nations. He was not called to be a priest. His father and grandfather are priests, but he was not called to be a priest, but he was called to be a prophet. Now, if you, if you are going to look at it and compare, the task of being a prophet is more demanding than the task of being a priest. It is uh, 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 harder to, to perform the uh, office of the prophet than to perform the office of the uh, priest. So you see, a prophet was a chosen and authorized spokesman for God who declared God's word to the people. So that is the primary job of a prophet. But in our time, and if you are not really that well-versed in the word of God, we often think of prophets as people who can tell the future. Like you are telling what will happen in the future or that you can see uh, the future. But actually a prophet spoke messages to the present that have future ramifications. They are more of a fourth tellers than they were four tellers. Prophets primarily exposed the people's sins and called them back to their covenant responsibilities before God. Because you see, these prophets were given uh, primarily to the Israelites so that they can be reminded of their covenant. They can be rebuked when they are disregarding the covenant and disobeying God. And it is the prophet's job to warn them so that they will go back to God. So being a prophet was more demanding than serving as a priest. And this might be the first excuse of uh, Jeremiah that his job or that the job that God is giving him is more demanding than what he has seen that his father and his grandfather did as a priest. You see, the priest's duties were predictable. Everything was written down in the law. Whatever they do, it's there in the law. They just have to read the law, follow it, and what they do is almost a routine. Almost the same every day, every month, every year when there is a feast, those are the things that they have to do. But the prophet never knew from one day to the next what the Lord would call him to say to the people or do to the people. So there is no set uh, 
a routine for a prophet. Yes, it is a routine to to uh, speak the word of God, but there is no. Uh, they do not know the specific message for today and what will be the message for tomorrow or what will be the message after that. Where to go and what to do. So the priests work primarily to preserve the past. That's why they take care of the uh, memorials, the uh, Passover, the feast of uh, God given to Israel. So the priest dealt with the externals, the rituals, the sacrifices, the offerings, and the services, whereas the prophet tried to reach and change heart. So what they're doing is preaching in the present so that it will have a result in the future for the glory of God. Priests ministered primarily to individuals with various needs, while the prophets, on the other hand, address whole nations. And usually, the people that they address, they address, address, that they address, do not want to listen, and they do not want to believe on their message, because that's why we have this uh, uh, phrase, prophet of doom, because almost always when they preach, it is a warning of an impending damnation from God if they are not going to change their ways. So, so to be a prophet is not really popular. Especially when the people of Israel is in that cycle of disobedience uh, before God. So they're going to hate what the prophet is going to say. The priests belong to a special tribe and therefore they had authority and respect from the tribe of uh, uh, Levi. Aaron. So the, 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 this, the, this is their, uh, their, they came from this tribe. They're respected because of what they do. But the purpose, on the other hand, is uh, uh, could not come from any tribe. No, but, but the prophet could come from any tribe, but have to prove his divine call. At least from the tribe of Levi, they know their priest. But the prophet can come from any tribe, and they have to prove that they have been called a prophet. Because even uh, God says that in, uh, I, think, I believe, Isaiah, that when a prophet says something that will not come true, they're not from God. So they have to prove that everything that they will say will come true, everything 100%, to prove that they are really a prophet from God. So you can see that it is really very hard to be in that position. And perhaps because of the Jeremiah, is, uh, is making an excuse that the call given to him by God is very demanding. It is very hard. There are so many things to do. And not only that, but priests were supported from the sacrifices and offerings of the people. But prophets had no guaranteed income. There is no uh, guaranteed income where the prophets can get their their livelihood. Uh, remember uh, Isaiah. No, no, not, uh, not Isaiah. Uh, Elijah and Elijah. They were even uh, asked by God to go into, the, into a widow's house in order to eat what was left of their meal. And then promised the widow that they will be eating for the rest of the famine during the time. So there is no guaranteed income for the prophets. So that's why uh, maybe in the mind of Jeremiah, this is going to be very hard. This is going to be very demanding. Maybe he preferred to just be a priest than to be a prophet for the Lord. But may I remind you that Jesus, that the Lord Jesus Christ too was called to be a prophet. Amen. He traveled from place to place challenging the people to change so that their future in heaven would be guaranteed. And even the Lord Jesus Christ says that he does not even have a pillow to lay his head. And there was not even a place that he can say that he owned. So you can see that, that the excuses that Jeremiah might try to give if 
if you will look at the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ happily accepted, joyfully accepted all of these things, and he continued to speak to the hearts of the people. Most of them, like Jeremiah, did not accept the message of repentance because these people do not want to change. So you can see that the calling of Jeremiah, though demanding as it is, Jeremiah is in a good company. And that is in the company of the greatest prophet who ever lived. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, God may assign you to a demanding task. But listen, his call keeps us going when we don't want to go and are ready to quit. We have the promise of God's purpose. You see, in verse number 5, Before I formed thee, the Lord uh, God says, In the belly I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of thy womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nation. That is God's promise to Jeremiah. That is God's encouragement to Jeremiah. There is a purpose that I have in your life. Amen? And that is for you to be a prophet. That is for you to speak the word of God. That is for you to warn the, the nation of God. That is for you to speak what will happen so that they will realize their sin, their mistake, they will repent, and they will go back to the Lord, to, to God, and, and the ways of God. And ladies and gentlemen, what is more important than for a person to know his purpose in life? Amen? So many people are at a loss. They do not know why they are here in this world in the first place. They do not know their purpose in life. They do not know the reason why they were created by God. But praise God, in the life of Jeremiah, at least he knew God's purpose in his life. Amen? And this purpose that he was recognized by God, that he was uh, uh, taken as worthy by God, and the purpose was given to him by God, should be enough motivation for Jeremiah to obey God and to keep on obeying God, no matter how hard that job may be for the Lord, because you are handpicked, you are chosen, and you are commissioned by God, the creator of the heaven and the earth, to serve him in the capacity that God has given you. Amen? These acts give one a great sense of purpose. You see, when a person finds God's will in his life, then that person can be very, very happy, can be very joyful, because now he knew why God Praise him in this word, and he knew what God wanted to accomplish in his life. The promise of God's purpose allows us to let go of our own plans and to receive God's plan without fear. Yes, it's hard, but it's doable. Yes, it's hard, but it can be done. Yes, it is hard, but God is involved in it. Like what, were, what was emphasized this morning, that we are partners with God. Amen? Imagine God calling you, commissioning you to be his partner in this particular job of being a prophet or a spokesman to the nation of Israel. And like in our time, we are co-laborers with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are partakers of whatever God has given to the Lord Jesus Christ and He commissioned us to do that very thing that His Father asked Him to do. He said, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. So what we're doing is the greatest job on earth. That would be enough reason so that we can let go of everything that we may want to accomplish in life. Let go of our ambition and put the will of God first in our lives. So no matter what happens, ladies and gentlemen, we must always allow God or allow His will to be our priority 
in life. Like Jeremiah and Jesus, we need to accept that our future is not our own. We are God's. He has a distinct plan and purpose for our lives, and all we have to do is to obey His will in our lives. Amen? Paul did that. Moses did that. Joseph did that. Daniel did that. The apostles did that. And I hope that each and every one of us will do that because the greatest call that we can have in our life is the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And then in verse number 6, we can see that Jeremiah started to make these excuses. Then said I, Our Lord, God, behold, I cannot speak, but he's talking to God. I cannot speak, for I am a child. You see, this is the uh, excuse that Moses and Jeremiah shared together when Moses says that I stammer. When he said that I, 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 I cannot speak, I'm not good in speaking. I'm not eloquent. I do not know what to say. And then, you know what God did? He, he gave Aaron to be his spokesperson in front of uh, Pharaoh. So, God has a way to overcome weakness and in our insufficiency. Because if God will call us, then he will supply our needs. He will enable us. He will not give us a mountain without giving us the strength to climb that mountain. He's not going to send us to a place without providing the needs or even the people that uh, are there so that we can win them to him and uh, become part of the church or whatever God wants us to accomplish in that place. But you see, we need to note this, that the person most aware of his inadequacy is usually the person most dependent on God's all-sufficient grace. You see, in the Bible, not too many nobles are chosen. Not too many uh, what we call uh, wise uh, people, wise in this world. Not too many rich, not too many noble, but God has chosen the base things of this world in order to confound the wise. You see, if you're self-righteous, God cannot use you. God can use a person who believes that he has no ability by himself, but everything must be dependent upon God. And that is usually the person that God will use because that person, whenever something is accomplished in his life, is not going to take the glory, but he will give the glory to God. Amen. So we need to understand that our inadequacies must cause us to rely upon God. You see, when God called you, do, even though you may feel unworthy, but it should not stop you from obeying God. That feeling of unworthiness or that feeling of inadequacy should spur us to trust God, knowing that we cannot accomplish anything without God and therefore we are safe because whatever we are going to do, it will be done in the power of God. And when things are done in the power of God, in the ways of God, in the wisdom of God, then everything is going to be successful in the estimation of God. The Bible is clear. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is quite clear when he says, Without me, ye can do nothing. The Apostle Paul is also very clear when he exclaimed, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So, if you feel that you're inadequate, then rejoice. Because God can use you. If you feel that you are empty of any skill or talent, rejoice because God can fill you with skills and talent and knowledge and wisdom so that He can use you in for His glory. The Apostle Paul actually has this attitude when he says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse number 9. 
when the apostle Paul says, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is where, where uh, we, we uh, coined the phrase, uh, we, are, we are strong when we are weak. Because of the strength of the Lord. It is not our own strength. When we feel that we are strong, then most often than not, we are going to lose the battle. When, when we feel that we are weak and only God can cause us victory, then most often than not, we are going to have the victory because of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, our talent may appear inadequate, but God always equips those he calls. Amen? There is always uh, the endowment of God to the people that he will call because God is a righteous God. He's not unrighteous to, to call you to do something and not give you the, uh, uh, the, 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 the things that you need, the talent that you need in order to accomplish the call or the command of God. You see, we have the promises of God's provision. Look at verse 9 of our text. Look at verse 9 of our text. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. What was the excuse of Jeremiah? I cannot speak, for I am a child. And then God touched his mouth and said, I have touched your mouth. And he said, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So it's not going to be what you are going to say, but what I am going to say through you. Amen? Do you remember what, what the Lord Jesus Christ says? That the Holy Spirit will come to us and then the Holy Spirit will remind us of the things that we need to say when we are in a particular situation. So you see, the touch was not so much to purify as it was to inspire and to empower. It was symbolic of the gift of prophecy bestowed on Jeremiah. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ also experienced the same thing. The touch, a visible touch, and yet in a profound way. You see, following the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ, immediately coming out, out of the water, the heavens opened, the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. And God spoke, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And that started the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. God blesses not the silver-tongued orator, but the one whose tongue has been touched by God with coals in his altar. You see, God uses not the most gifted and talented person, but the one touched by the hand of God. God uses the most unlikely persons to shake a church, a community, or a nation. That is why we should never underestimate the power of the touch of God. Especially when God does the touching. Remember that song, He Touched Me? And after the touch of God, things are never the same again. Why? Because there is power in the touch of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that song about the old violin? When it was touched by the Master, it gave so much inspiration and value to that violin. Why? It is because of the touch of the master's hand. That's why it was said and it's being said over and over and over again it is not us. It is all of God. It is only because of Jesus. It is only because of God. And the reason why Jeremiah can do God's call even though it's hard it is because of the power of God through the help of the Holy Spirit. So, what is your excuse in not soul winning? What is our excuse in not worshiping? What is our excuse in not 
giving our talents to God. What is your excuse in not being faithful in the things of the Lord? You see, if God calls you to do something, then He will help you do that something provided you are willing to obey. And that is how God will work in our lives. Look at verse number 6 of Jeremiah chapter 1. Then said I, Our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. See the excuse there? The excuse is, it's not the right time. Maybe when I'm old, I can do it. Maybe when I'm established, I can do it. Maybe when I have experienced everything that I want to experience in life, then maybe that's the time that I am going to do it. But please note, uh, the word here, uh, child, does not uh, speak of that Jeremiah is a, uh, like for example, a very, very, very young person, like 10 years old, 12 years old, something like that. According to most uh, commentaries and some Bible scholars, uh, Jeremiah may be in the age of between 20 to 25 at this uh, time. So the word child there connotes, uh, uh, may mean a, a, a young man who is not yet married, who is not yet uh, established uh, in uh, life. Uh, when, when, when Jeremiah said, that I am a child, it actually uh, giving a deep sense of immaturity that is not yet ready to do what God is asking him to do. He felt inferior. He felt inexperienced and of course intimidated because you're going to speak for God to the whole nation. And then the message that you're going to give them is something that they dislike. It's something that they're going to hate. So it is, it is, it is as if you're say, saying, Yes, Lord, people will hate me. Yes, Lord, people will persecute me. Yes, Lord, people will dislike me. Yes, Lord, they will even try to kill me. Yes, Lord, that is what I'm going to do for thee. And that's very hard. For even any of us to say yes to. So he's say, telling God that this may not be the right time for me to do these things in life. But you see, God's call may come at in an inopportune time. But he never sends forth his servant alone. Listen. He never sent forth his servant alone alone. Jeremiah will not go alone in this particular job, in this particular calling of God. Why? Because God promised His presence. Look at verses 7 to 8. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee. Amen? That's enough. For I am with thee. God is with Jeremiah. You and God is a majority. Amen. When God is there, it is never a minority. When God is there, you are never at a disadvantage. If you have God, then you have all the power of God ready at this disposal in your life. You see, uh, in the Bible it says that the eyes of the Lord is uh, uh, in every place beholding the good and evil and then the Lord is looking for a person who will uh, bridge the gap and, and, uh, uh, and when God is looking for that person because he wants to uh, perform or make manifest his power in that person. So when God calls you to do something, it is actually God who will do it for you. It is actually God who will give you all the needed resources in order for His command to be accomplished in your life. But there is a condition. Before Jeremiah could experience 
God's presence, he had to go where God sent him. You need to go. You're not going to have the presence of God if you will stay. Oh, but pastor, you see, isn't it that anywhere we go, God is there? Not in the Old Testament. No, the Spirit of God comes and goes in the Old Testament. But whenever Jeremiah go to a place where God wants him to be, then his presence is there. If he will speak what God told him to speak, then God will be with him. And if he is going to reject fear from the people, then God will be there. Remember, there was this person, uh, Balaam, who is supposed to be a spokesman for God, but he says something that God did not ask him to say. And God was not with him. But whenever a prophet will speak whatever God wants him to say, God is there. He, when he goes wherever wants him, God wants him to go, he is there. And if he is not fearful, then God will be there and he will enjoy the presence of God. You see, someone once said that when God calls us to a task, he does not give us a road map to follow and then leave us to our resources. When God calls you, he will go with you. He will never leave you alone. God will walk with you. His presence gives us the strength to stand in the face of every assault that we may experience doing God's call. And the Lord Jesus Christ felt that same presence. He and the Father are one. He could go on because God the Father is walking with him. What a difference it makes knowing that when we are being sent, someone is going with us. We know we do not have to walk the lonesome road alone. That we have a traveling companion and the traveling companion is none other than the creator of the heavens and the earth. Amen? So that is an encouragement so that Jeremiah will not listen to his own excuses. Then I believe also there is the excuse of that the message that he's going to give is dangerous. That is going to be, you know, very hard for Jeremiah to deliver the message. Because the message that God is asking Jeremiah to preach is not a joyful message. You see, today many preachers are beloved. They are really admiring them because they are giving a message of hope, false hope, and a message of prosperity, that you're going to be rich. You're going to have uh, the best that the world can offer. You see, the best that the world can offer. It is not what God is offering. That you're going to have health and wealth. And that you are going to be a good person. The best ver ver uh, version of you. That is what these preachers are promising. So they are well sought after. They are popular. They are uh, famous because their message is a joyful message to hear. His message is not a joyful message of deliverance, but a tragic message of judgment. You see, you preach things that will entertain and make people good, then the church will be filled to the rafters. But you preach the truth, then people will not come to the church. Why? People just hate the truth because the truth hurts. And the truth will reveal who we really are. You see, in preaching this kind of message, consequently, Jeremiah would be misunderstood. He will be persecuted. He will be arrested. And he will be imprisoned. All of these things happen in the life of Jeremiah. More than once uh, in his life, he was threatened. These people did not want to hear the truth. 
Jeremiah told them plainly that they were defying the Lord, disobeying the law, and destined for judgment. You see, when you preach a happy message, when you preach an entertaining message, people in the church are very happy. But when you preach a message that is truthful to the Word of God, truthful to our real condition, then people will not appreciate that except those people who love God and who knows who they are in the sight of God. You tell them that if you are not uh, involved and you are not concerned in the uh, souls of the lost people, you are not saved. Then there we tell you that you are judgmental in your preaching. They say that if you do not give, you do not care for the ministry of God. They said that you only are interested in their money than uh, in the things of the Lord, than for the Lord himself. If you, if you uh, preach that we need to constantly obey God in our lives, then they will tell that the preacher does not understand the concerns that they are experiencing on a daily basis. Is this really hard to preach the truth? Because it will make you unpopular and it will make you unwelcome to so many people who are living a life of disobedience in the sight of God. Look at Jeremiah 1.13. Here is a, one of the two illustrations that, that God used in order to communicate his wrath to Israel. And uh, he says, And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot. And the face thereof is toward the north. So you see, uh, in Jewish homes, they would have a fairly large, uh, what you call, wide mouth washing or cooking pot. Parang yung mga, pag maraing kakain, like church anniversary, we use a, a very large uh, you know, co cooking pot. Uh, but the uh, unusual thing about the pot that Jeremiah saw was that it was not level. But, it was tilted away from the north. If this is the north, it's tilted away from the north. So it's uh, actually facing the south. So, the pot could at any moment spew its boiling contents towards the south, scalding the people of Judah. So meaning to say God's judgment is imminent. Anytime it will come down to the people of Judah. And God is referencing uh, the pagan nation that is going to use, which is Babylon, to represent that path that God will use in order to punish Judah and to conquer Israel because of their disobedience to God. You see, that was the message that Jeremiah is bringing the people. And this is also the same teaching contained in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it is filled with mercy and judgment. And yet, it is filled with grace and also punishment. The teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ were dangerous too. In fact, it cost him his life. And, Jer and it almost cost Jeremiah his life as he tried to preach this to the people of Judah and the people of Israel. That's why standing behind the pulpit is not an easy task. Because you are preaching to people. And sometimes, when you preach to people, sometimes the people may not see that you're also preaching to yourself. That what you're telling that they are guilty of may be the same thing that you are guilty of. And it takes a lot of repentance, a lot of meditating, a lot of looking inside your heart before you actually preach the message of God. Because preaching is not, it's not, a, uh, not a play. It's not, not you, you, it is as if you're just acting or performing or entertaining people. But you're preaching the word of God so you can preach to your own condemnation. And 
And this is what the message that Jeremiah is going to bring to the people. You see, what God says through us may be dangerous, but God gives us the strength to endure. We have the promise. Jeremiah had the promise in verses 18 and 19. This is what God told him. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. So we have the promise of God's prevailing. Note at the terms that God used. He says, Jeremiah, you are a defensed city. You're being defended. You are an iron pillar. You are a brazen wall. What are these? These are solid and unshakable things that God conceived in order for the prophet to be protected in the things that he is going to do or accomplish for God, though it may be very, very dangerous. God reassured Jeremiah, attack you, they will, but overcome you, they can't. Yes, they will attack you, but they are not going to prevail against you. The person who stands with God will prevail. Somebody said, one with God is a majority. Alone, we are helpless, but with God, we always prevail. I, I, I read of a, uh, an article regarding a, a, a monk named uh, Telemachus. He lived in a 404 AD in Rome when Honorius was emperor of Rome. It was during the time when gladiators are very popular. When Christians are being fed to the lions in the Colosseum, where gladiators are fighting and killing each other as a sport. And the Roman uh, people, especially those that are rich, are finding satisfaction in seeing blood, in seeing people kill each other. But one day, during one of the events, in that Colosseum, this Telemachus just jumped into the arena and he shouted, Enough! This should stop! This should never happen again! Meaning to say, this vanity must stop! And because of that, the uh, uh, leader of uh, that event asked the gladiators to come inside and to kill Telemachus. And then he was almost... Uh, decimated because of, of, of these gladiators who killed them. But there was an eerie silence when Telemachus was killed. It is as if the message finally came into the heart of the people. And since that day, the desire of the people for blood in that Colosseum, in that arena, waned until the time they, they do not do it anymore. You see, Telemachus is only one person. But because he speak, he spoke what is in his mind. He stood for God, and God stood with him. Then his voice was heard. The voice of God was heard, and there was victory because of the Lord. Amen? When you stand with God, you and God is always a majority. His death was not in vain. It accomplished the purpose of God. And then, lastly, in verse number 17, Thou therefore geared up thy loins, and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee, be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before thee. So God is asking Jeremiah, he's saying, I'm a child. He's saying, it's not the right time. But God told Jeremiah, you need to go now. You see, when God 
calls, he is expecting immediate action from Jeremiah. And the same thing with us. When he says to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature, it means now. It means we have to do it now. It means we have to act now. Why? Because the king's business requires haste. It is an urgent job. People are dying every day. That is why, as a Christian, we cannot procrastinate in obeying the will of God in our lives. You see, this uh, particular verse has given us the, the idea of uh, when the Lord calls us, we need to roll up our sleeves and then do the job immediately. Gird up thy loins. Uh, you see, preparing for a swift movement or going to a battle. It was a metaphor that meant get ready for action. So when God calls Jeremiah, God called Jeremiah to act. He was called to move out among people. He was called to deliver an offensive message. He would not be welcomed, nor he would be accepted, but he will do it as an act of obedience to God. Why? Because God promised him something. He has the promise of the power of God. He says, and speak unto them, all that I command thee, be not dismayed of their faces, lest I confound thee before thee. And in the next verse, God clearly says, I am going to be with thee. I'm wondering why he said that, be not dismayed of their faces. Because when you deliver the message of doom, the message of judgment, you will see faces that are not uh, good to look at. There will be angry faces. There will be faces of hateful people. Faces that will be ready to kill you. But he said, do not be dismayed. Lest I confound thee before them. You see, immediate ob obedience is the only appropriate response when God calls. And Jesus obeyed. Jesus says, not my will. Amen? But thy will be done. You see, whatever you think of Jesus, remember this. His heart was a willing and obedient heart. And I hope and I pray that we are going to have the same heart. But sad to say, we have a very hard heart when it comes to the will of God. But Jesus, he always did what his father directed him to do. You cannot see any hesitation. You cannot see any questioning of the will of the father. There is no circumventing of God's will in his life. But he showed only immediate action. So the question today is this. Has God called you? If God called you, then he will fulfill his promise in you. He will fulfill His promise in me. He will equip us. He will enable us. He will protect us. He will accompany us as we obey His will. Listen, people will destroy you, hate you, and they will try to do everything that the devil will direct them to do so that you will be uh, pulled out or even pushed out of the will of God. But then just stay firm. Stand fast. Keep on keeping on. Because God will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You see, life will never be easy for a person obeying the will of God. God promised that. You will have persecution. You will experience tribulation. And they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That is the practical result of living for God. Because we are in this world and the world they hated the things of God. And if we will always show the things of God in our lives, live God's will in our lives, obey God's will in our lives, then people will get angry. Why? Because our life is going to be a condemnation for the life that they are living in this world. 
But it is so sad if the world liked us because they could not see any difference in our lives. So this is our lot, ladies and gentlemen. Something that we cannot escape from. If you want to live the best of this world, then you're not living for God. Then you're not going to live for God. But if you want to live with eternity in mind, then you have to endure hardness. Because we are a soldier and we are fighting a battle in this world. And this battle is never easy. It's going to be hard. But if we will put the whole armor of God and we will use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, then we can prevail by the grace of God. Why? Because God is always here to protect us. So how about it? Are we ready to obey His will? Are we ready not to make any more excuses, but simply obey the will of God? But pastor, sometimes I do not understand. Well, it is not our business to understand everything that God is asking us to do. It is our job to do it. To obey. And then when the result comes in, then we will see the wisdom and the power of God. I don't think that uh, Noah understood everything when God asked him to build an ark. There was no rain in the middle of the mountain. The, there is no practical use that he can see for the ark. And that is why he... They said that he's crazy. But he built it. For how long? More than a hundred years, right? 120 years. And at the same time preaching the word of God. He may not understand everything. But he knows that God is wise. And all he has to do is to obey God. Abraham may not understand everything when God asked him to leave his kindred, his country, and go to a place where God will show him thereafter. He may not understand it, but he knew it's a better city because God is the one directing him to do it. You see, sometimes our problem or the things that are hindering us to obey God is because of our plans in our lives. We have our plans, we have our ambitions. We think that we have figured everything out and that God would just have to step in and help us accomplish what we want in life. But it's the other way around. We must give God a blank page and we must ask God to write everything that he wants to write there and we will be always at God's disposal. No excuses because God can provide everything that we need to accomplish His will in our lives. Shall we stand up please? While every heads are bowed and as we have